Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our, our guest speaker, who has already been named, um, needs no introduction because he is a, is a world famous epidemiologist. Uh, and it's absolutely wonderful to have him uh, here with us today. Um, in addition to being a world famous epidemiologist, he's also been a great friend of, the, of Stellenbosch. And I have to mention that uh, he was um, for a number of years an extraordinary professor at the faculty and helped us with, te with teaching on the MSc in clinical epidemiology in its early, early years. And we are very grateful uh, to, to Madhu for that. But let me introduce Madhu a little bit more formally. Research Chair in Epidemiology and Global Health at McGill University, Montreal. He is the Director of McGill, uh, uh, of McGill Global Health Programs and director of the McGill International TB Center. He did his medical training and community medicine residency in Velo, India, and later completed a PhD in epidemiology at UC Berkeley and a postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF. Madhu has served as a consultant to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He currently serves on the STAG TB Committee of the WHO Geneva, Scientific, Scientific Advisory Committee of Fine Geneva, and Access Advi Advisory Committee of TB Alliance, New York. Previously, he has served on the coordinating board of the Stop TB Partnership. In addition, he is a member of the editorial boards of Lancet Infectious Diseases, PLOS Medicine, eLife, PLOS One, International Journal of TB and Lung Disease, among others. Madhu's research is mainly focused on improving the diagnosis and treatment of tuberculosis, especially in high burden countries like India and South Africa. His research is supported by grant funding from the Gates Foundation, grant Challenges Canada and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. He has authored more than 440 peer reviewed publications and has a Scopus H index of 84. He is a recipient of the Union Scientific uh, Prize, Chan Chanli Global Health Research Award, Haley T. DeBass Prize, and in addition, Madhu is a member of the Royal Society of Canada and an elected fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Madhu, it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to address us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I will now share my screen um, and uh, hope you can see it. Please let me know if my Slides are visible now. Yes? Jimmy, can you hear me? I, I can and I can see your slides. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, let me begin by uh, congratulating uh, Stellenbosch on your 64th uh, annual academic day. Um, even in the midst of this crisis, it's nice to um, stop and pause and celebrate these uh, small milestones. Um, before I dive into this uh, topic, um, I want to um, say that uh, I'm like all of you, I'm a fellow academic. Uh, and I don't claim to have any great wisdom or insights about COVID-19 um, or, uh, or uh, anything uh, in this crisis, because like all of you, I'm struggling. Like all of you, I'm trying to make sense of everything that's happening around us. And uh, as much as I'm trying to make a contribution, um, I think this, this talk is really more to share my anxieties with you uh, as a fellow academic. And I hope uh, 
uh, you will not see this as the as the definitive word on anything, but use this to have your own discussions uh, in your own context, in your own country, on what COVID is doing to academic scholarship and to science at large. And what is it that we all need to do to worry about uh, some of the trends that we are starting to see? Um, and I've been writing about this. Uh, this piece uh, I was invited to write uh, for this uh, for, by Nature Medicine, uh, in part because I've been blogging about my concerns. And the Nature editor saw my blog and, uh, and my tweets on this. And, and she said, why don't you write something about this for, for Nature Medicine, which I did. And you're welcome to, to see it. It's, it's open access. Uh, and many people around the world have emailed me or texted me or replied to my tweet um, about their own anxieties about what COVID is doing to, to research. And I'm fully aware that your agenda today is primarily about uh, Stellenbosch researchers working on COVID. And by no means, uh, I'm trying to say that that research is unimportant. Okay, so that is not at all what I'm here to, to talk about. Um, in fact, it's pretty, um, pretty uh, insightful and thoughtful that I've been invited to give this talk uh, precisely on a day when Stellenbosch uh, researchers are showcasing uh, their COVID-19 research. So I, I made the comment in my piece that we find ourselves uh, all COVIDized. Um, by that, I mean... Uh, I think every crisis is a strong call to mobilize the entire research community to act or respond. I think we saw that with the HIV uh, crisis uh, more than 30 years ago. I think we saw that with the Ebola crisis. We saw that with the Zika virus crisis. Uh, we've seen that with the climate change crisis. So I don't think COVID-19 is any exception. Uh, we do need to respond um, uh, to a crisis. Um, and we find ourselves in this very uh, bizarre situation where all of us as researchers, universities like us, uh, funding agencies, philanthropies, journals, journalists, media, the general public, everybody's attention is pivoted en masse to just one thing, COVID-19. And that's why I've been uh, jokingly calling this as we are all COVIDized. Now, what are the implications of this? And I'll give you some examples of how, how severely COVIDized the world is right now. I mean, since about March of this year, I think every single funding agency on planet Earth have launched new calls for COVID-19 funding. And you might say, yes, this is a good idea, right? And apparently billions of dollars um, have been invested in COVID-19, billions, not millions. And um, one big concern here is, is this new money or is this just money pulled away from other areas of research? And I know for a fact that for most agencies, it is not new money. It's money pulled away from other research priorities, including open competitions. In fact, in my country, Canada, a Canadian Institute of Health Research stopped the, an open competition that was already underway, which means completely free investigator-driven research, and then opened a call just for COVID. And you will not believe the stampede that ensued. More than 1,500 people applied for a COVID-19 competition. And I promise you, most had absolutely no prior training in infectious diseases, epidemiology, virology, anything to do with COVID-19. They were all trying to survive uh, because you close all gates and then you open one narrow gate, everybody is stampeding towards that narrow gate. And this really worries the heck out of me. And I've been really, really distressed over this single laser focused among funding agencies and how harmful it could be to people working in other areas outside of COVID. In fact, philanthropies have pivoted so much. This uh, Financial Times article says, Gates Foundation will now concentrate on COVID-19. And Bill Gates says, this new commitment means that charities, other public health work will suffer. That distressed me a lot to see that uh, being posted Subsequently, the foundation clarified 
that they're not going to be stopping other work, but I still worry about what an impact COVID will have. Universities, uh, even in my own universities, it's always COVID, 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 COVID calls, COVID seed grants, COVID scientists are showcased all the time. And, and I keep wondering, oh man, if I wasn't working on COVID, what do I what do I do to get my university's attention in this crisis, right? Do I even matter if I'm not working on, on COVID? And, and many scientists have been really worried about where this is all headed towards and what the implications of this can be. And, and we all have seen through social media or even by just chatting and looking at the preprints that are coming our way, all sorts of people are now COVID researchers. I mean, I'm, I'm not even talking about people in health. I'm talking about mathematicians, quantitative biologists, quantum physicists, uh, chemists, electrical engineers, you name it. They're all starting to pivot towards COVID. And this Nature article kind of tried to quantify how dramatic the shifts are. And then it, and the, and the article says, the pandemic mixed up what scientists study and some won't go back. In other words, they're going to abandon their primary area or their primary passion or mission and focus on something like COVID for the coming years. That truly boggles my mind. It really does. And it should make us so worried uh, as, to, as to why people with deep expertise in some other field feel so compelled to abandon what they're doing and focus on COVID and what the, what the negative consequences of that could be. And lo and behold, when you make everybody stampede towards COVID funding, and when you prioritize COVID in journals and media and universities and philanthropies, and when people are pivoting en masse to COVID, what happens? This is what happens. Uh, at the last count, more than 60,000 articles on COVID already, uh, more than 20,000 preprints on COVID. Um, it's like absolute uh, chaos. It's like a feeding frenzy, as I call it. And more than 4,000 randomized controlled trials have been registered on COVID-19. And just on hydroxychloroquine alone, there are well over 150 randomized trials on hydroxychloroquine. Now, why would we need so many studies on hydroxychloroquine, especially now that we know it doesn't work. What are we trying to do? And why is there so much waste and redundancy in the way we are doing uh, research and science? And should we not spend that hydroxychloroquine trial money on other useful priorities that need to get done? That's the kind of reflexivity that I'm looking for in our own field among our own colleagues. And so, I kind of jokingly uh, saying that um, COVID-19 is now this black hole that is like a gigantic magnetic attractor that's sucking all of us towards it. Whether we are academics, whether we are funders, whether we are deans, whether we are universities, whether we are media or journalists, it is like, it is impossible to escape um, the COVID-19 black hole that's threatening to suck us all in. So what does this really mean now? I want to first acknowledge the opportunities. I do see the opportunities. And in some ways, I'm also benefiting from it because I am in public health. I am, I do work on infectious diseases. I am an epidemiologist. So opportunities for someone like me are actually incredible during this pandemic crisis. And so in some ways, if I were to be very selfish, I would say this is a great time for someone like me and case closed. And so I do want to acknowledge the opportunities, but I also want to point out the risks. I think the opportunities are firstly, I think we are all desperate to help end the pandemic and get back to life. So to that extent, anyone who's working on COVID, I think is well-intentioned. They really want to say, okay, I want to put my hand up. I want to help end this damn pandemic and I want to get back to life, which I think is important. New funding opportunities, academics, we are what we are, and we are always pulled like magnets whenever there are funding opportunities. That's true for you, that's true for me, that's true for all of us. New collaborations. COVID-19 has made us come up with some really creative solutions, innovations, as uh, Jimmy mentioned. 
and a chance to do some really interesting interdisciplinary work. Because as Jimmy mentioned, it's not just the medical consequences, there are social consequences, there are gendered impacts, so on and so forth. It's a chance for some of us to dramatically increase our publication output. Right? There are people whose CVs have doubled in the last six months. Uh, a chance to be in the media. Who doesn't want to be on television every night, right? Who doesn't want to be in the headlines of a, of a newspaper? Uh, and, and some of the long lasting positive impact could be that the world finds a way to come up with new innovations like new therapeutic and vaccines and rapidly trial them and get them out much faster than what normal scientific processes allow us to do. And hopefully, I'm hoping that all of this, uh, this um, mobilization will prepare us for the next crisis whenever that comes along. So I acknowledge the opportunities and I must say, I have also benefited from some of these opportunities. I would be lying if I didn't say that wasn't the case. But I really think it behooves all of us as scientists, first and foremost, as academics, first and foremost, as good citizens, to stop and pause and say, what are the risks of this craziness that we are seeing? If everybody and everything is COVIDized, could this be harmful for us in the long run? We might benefit in the short run, but could this be bad in the long run? And here is a long list of risks that I've been worried about and writing about. I think there is this massive fear of missing out among all of us right now that if you're not working on COVID, life is passing us by, that we are somehow going to suffer if we do not focus on COVID because people will not care about us, that somehow it is critical that we, that, that we continue to uh, focus on COVID. In fact, after reading my Nature Medicine article, I received an email from a, from a professor who works on normally on uh, research relating to anesthesiology he or she writes to me and says, uh, I'm so grateful to you for writing that piece because I was thinking I was failing because I'm not rushing to divert to find a cure for COVID. But your article validated my own primary passion and my research, and I'm very grateful for you. It's apparent that, that she was really having this big fear of missing out, that by not working on COVID, she was doing something bad. With her, with her expertise. The other second big risks we wanna talk about is bad, rushed, sloppy science, ridiculous science, science that should not see the light of the day is getting airtime right now. A massive lowering, active lowering of scientific standards is happening right now. A flood of dubious retracted research that is causing deafening levels of noise that we can no longer separate signal from the noise redundancy and wastage, erosion of public trust in science, pit the risk of pivoting to an area that simply may not sustain, the risk of getting it wrong, completely wrong, because we are indulging in epistemic trespassing. There is a massive securitization of research, health research happening right now. And the all pervasive likely to be dangerous neglect of other critical research priorities in health and even outside of health. So let me walk you through some of these concerns. I mean, this article in, uh, in the Wired magazine really hit the nail on the head that the science of this pandemic is moving at dangerous speeds, that much of the research that emerges will turn out to be unreliable or just wrong. And we've already seen how many ideas thrown around that we're completely garbage and actually dangerous uh, in terms of what people are putting out. I mean, when we rush to preprint without even adequately thinking through what we're doing, and if that gets picked up by the media and the policymakers, we really have to think hard about what potential harm could be caused. And that whole hydroxychloroquine fiasco, in my opinion, is one example of this absolute craziness speed at, at which things are moving, right? Um, one little study in France and a Donald Trump tweet and the whole world goes bonkers and millions and billions of dollars have been wasted. This is not the way we would normally be doing science. Pre-COVID, if there was an early signal, 
the right response would be, yeah, this looks promising. Let's study it further. During COVID, you see an early signal. The response is, let's give it to everybody. I mean, that's just bullshit. And we cannot continue to do science like this. This would be disastrous for science at large. We have to really slow it down and get start getting science right. Speed is not always important. And this directly ties to this lovely piece by my colleague in, in, in science that, that crises are no excuse for lowering scientific standards. And we've seen any number of examples of this. I mean, the, the announcement of Donald Trump and the US FDA to use convalescent plasma without even a single randomized trial is not something that will normally happen. We are actively lowering scientific standards. Um, India's decision to give hydroxychloroquine to thousands and thousands of people with not even a shred of data is an example of lowering of scientific standards. I mean, this is happening every single minute around us and we have to say, what is the long-term risks when you set the bar so low for anything else in future? And we normally fight for holding up scientific standards and it's like everybody is actively setting the bar lower and lower and lower. And I've been fighting this madness with my, in my own field where there's some early ecological studies that BCG vaccine might protect against COVID. Most of the ecological studies are seriously flawed. And yet there are countries which are like, oh my God, let's start giving BCG to everyone. I'm just like, is that absolute bonkers? Where is the direct evidence that giving BCG will protect against COVID? Normally you would trial it. You would not rush around taking away a childhood TB vaccine, which is already in scarce supply and run behind something without adequate data to back that. We have to really ask ourselves what this lowering of stand scientific standards could mean to us. And the retractions, oh my God, this has been terrible for science and public trust in science. I mean, people are saying we don't even trust Lancet New, New England Journal papers anymore because they're all in this bloody mess and they're all lowering scientific standards. They're letting bullshit papers come through and retractions can really damage public trust. Journalists are asking me, we don't even know what to, to trust anymore. We thought Lancet and New England Journal and good paper, uh, you know, high impact journals meant something. We're not sure anymore. And if you have a flood of retracted papers, it's very hard to now go and say trust in science. Yes, retractions can happen even in the best of days, even without COVID, retractions are normal part of science. But these high profile retractions and the number of retractions we are starting to see are really starting, I worry, to damage public trust in science. Mm -hmm. and, and we already spoke about 150 plus trials on hydroxychloroquine as an example of how dysfunctional academic research can be. Academics are, it's a stereotype, but academics can sometimes be lone wolves. Give me the money, leave me alone, I'll do my own research. We're not really necessarily very good sometimes at collaborating. Yes, there are examples such as recovery trial, solidarity trial, but we could have been much more thoughtful about how we've approached this pandemic research and try to do them as networks of collaborative research and answered questions faster and not duplicated each other's work. But now everybody wants their own underfunded COVID uh, hydroxychloroquine randomized control trial. And we're not sure how this is all adding up. And just the number of you know, registered hydroxychloroquine uh, trials show complete lack of coordination and disorganization. And, and not just that, the number of trials that are registered, 4,000 plus, somebody's done an analysis. Many of them are apparently too small to answer the question. Many of them are open label with potential for serious biases and very few are double blind randomized control trials. So even the trials that are ongoing are probably weak, poor quality, and not likely to answer the questions that we're really setting out to do. I mean, this is serious wastage of, of uh, time, of money, and randomizing patients when we know we're not going to answer uh, the question also raises serious ethical issues, in my opinion. And this whole issue of epistemic trespassing, I mean, I, I didn't know until recently that there was a term like that. Epistemic trespassing, according to this very nice article in Scientific American by Nathan Ballantyne and David Dunning, is occurs when commentators holding real expertise in one field intrude into another, passing judgment where they lack crucial competence. And they say roaming into a field without expert level insight 
trespassers easily slip up. We've had absolute bullshit studies published as preprints uh, or, or, or in the media where people who are doing that work have zero expertise in that area. I mean, I've, I've spent years training to acquire expertise in a narrow area. And I would not dream, as a, as a TB researcher, I would never dream of publishing a paper in cardiology. What do I know about cardiology, right? Beyond whatever little medical training I have, I would not dream of doing that. And yet cardiologists are publishing on hydroxychloroquine and having their papers retracted. Orthopedic surgeons are writing that we should be giving BCG vaccine to the whole world. I mean, where does this nonsense end? I mean, this is just absolute um, uh, rubbish stuff that cucumber and cabbage uh, will save us from COVID-19, that vitamin D will save us, sunlight will save us, bleach will save us. There is a cacophony of rubbish stuff being put out by people who absolutely have no business working in this area or writing about it. And I think we should ask, who do we really trust? Now, now everybody is now confused because everybody is a COVID expert. So who is the real COVID expert and who is not? And who is the real reliable source of information and who is not? Journalists are confused, public's confused. Nobody seems to know what the hell is going on in this crisis. And, and I jokingly say, that COVID-19 seems to have completely flipped the normal hierarchy of evidence pyramid, right? You have now WhatsApp and tweets on the top and you have anecdotes and you have ecological correlation and case series and, and low quality research right at the top getting so much attention. And then you have very few real good quality evidence from randomized trials or meta-analysis at the bottom. This is a very sad state of affairs and it is not the way how we would have normally envisioned as academics, as scholars, how we would like to uh, see a, a field moving. And so uh, a couple of months ago, I was so alarmed with the kind of journalistic reporting that was I was seeing uh, in my own field and, and around COVID. And I said, oh man, I need to, I could do something about it, right? We are all online now, we are all under lockdown. So I put out a tweet saying, are there journalists who would like me to give them an online course on epidemiology through Zoom? I had thousands of people respond to me. So I decided to do a two week course for Indian journalists on Zoom um, and 80 journalists from India participated in the course. And then inspired by that, I teamed up with a whole bunch of African experts, uh, including Taryn Young from Stellenbosch. And we finished a course for uh, journalists around Africa, 15 plus countries in Africa online on Zoom, trying to educate journalists to be more skeptical, to be more thoughtful about what they write, to not give a rubbish anecdote as much importance as a randomized control trial, to critique a randomized control trial and ask if it's a high quality trial or not, uh, to, 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 to resist the lowering of scientific standards is what we were hoping to do. And I'm hoping this kind of training will almost become a requirement for people working in health journalism. And then my last concerns is more about Will health research secu survive securitization? There's always been this concern that global health as a field is being securitized. In other words, if it is not a pandemic threat, we will not support or fund that area of work, right? If it's a pandemic threat that's likely to come and hit our shores, whichever rich country we are working in, then only we will invest in that area of global health. Now, we cannot expect every health research to be a pandemic threat. Right. Let's imagine you're working on on mental health. Do you now have to come up with the security uh, 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 angle or spin to sell it to someone? Does every researcher now have to justify their research work that it might have some consequence for pandemics in future? What if I was working on uh, neglected tropical diseases? How do I make the connection that is going to be a pandemic threat that kills millions of people? I can't do that. And I shouldn't be forced to do that. What happens to people who are working outside of infectious diseases? Is their work less relevant now? What about students who are working on many other areas of research that have nothing to do with infectious diseases? Do they now have to concoct some weird pandemic security threat to kind of sell their research? We shouldn't force researchers into such narrow areas and expect them to justify their existence like that. And it's disastrous to be uh, doing that, in my opinion. And what happens to all the critical areas? Um, I mean, TB deaths are 
going up everywhere. Malaria deaths in sub-Saharan Africa are expected to double in the coming year. HIV deaths will go up because antiretrovirals are not reaching people. Routine immunization has come to a stop. Mental health services were bad even before COVID and it's even worse now. Contraceptives are not reaching women. 15 million unintended pregnancies. Jimmy spoke about domestic violence against women. One billion people are being pushed into poverty and this is the single biggest global recession since World War II. Are we saying that these are priorities we should stop researching on? That if we are passionate about these areas, we should all divert to COVID-19? To me, that would be absolutely tragic if that happened because these are all critical areas of health and we cannot think about health through purely through the prism of infections or pandemic. Health research is way broader than that. And so I argued in my piece that we need designated drivers, right? Yes, some of us will pivot, will need to pivot, want to pivot and should pivot to help with the COVID response. But that there, there are those of us who are really passionate about something else. I'm pa really passionate about TB and I have decided for myself that I'm gonna stay laser beam focused on TB. Yes, I might look at the impact of COVID on TB, but TB continues to be my number one research agenda. And I've decided not to stray away from it because I know my field of TB research is very thin. And if all of us dropped TB research and moved on to COVID, I don't think the, the, the TB field can take it. And I think the same applies. If you're very passionate about diabetes work, I think the world needs you. If you're very passionate about environmental health, the world needs you. If you're super duper passionate about finding a cure for Parkinson's disease, the world needs you. I think we really need to stay true to our passion. In fact, I think passion is the biggest driver of our best science. We've trained our entire lives to work on an area. And if we are best when we focus on that area, if we go to COVID-19, we will simply not have that passion and we will not do the same good job that we will do if we worked on something else. So I'm arguing that at least some of us should stay true to our primary mission and do the best darn research in that area. And that's basically what my single biggest conclusion in the nature medicine piece was. Science, strategic thinking in science cannot go crisis to crisis because crisis makes us make bad decisions, right? All of us make bad decisions in a crisis because we're stressed, we're not thinking clearly enough. And I think science requires long-term strategic vision that should not deviate like a, like a puff of wind based on which crisis is coming because crises come and go. You need a long-term uh, thinking and strategic vision. And I don't think crisis-driven thinking is good for scientific planning. In other words, priorities for research should not be dictated by what is the current crisis that is happening, right? We cannot go crisis to crisis to set priorities. And what if the next crisis is not a pandemic? Imagine if we continue to pivot like this and put all our eggs into uh, pandemic diseases. What if the next crisis is a massive climate crisis? Do you think our pandemic research will save us for that? No, we need scientists working right now on finding solutions for the climate crisis. That's how we will be prepared for the next crisis. In other words, a broad-based research agenda that flourishes for multiple areas of research is the best way to prepare it for a future crisis, in my opinion, not focusing on just one sliver of pandemic threats. So um, in, my, in, my, uh, in conclusion, I would say all health research cannot be, should not be about a pandemic or infectious threats, and all infectious diseases research cannot be or should not be about COVID-19. Diversity in research, I argue, is absolutely critical and fundamental to any society and will be the best way we could prepare for the next crisis, whatever that might be. So I want to thank all of you. Um, I do miss Stellenbosch. It's been many, many years since I visited your beautiful campus. And I'm, I apologize that I've not been as engaged as I should have been. Um, but now that the world has gone online, maybe there are more opportunities to collaborate with Stellenbosch. But I do appreciate you inviting me. Uh, and I would like to thank Jimmy, Nico, and the entire team. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madhu, uh, for a very interesting, thought-provoking uh, talk. And colleagues, I would urge you to also download the paper and, and read through it. Very interesting uh, thoughts from our guest speaker, Madhu, uh, long-term friend of Stellenbosch University, and we're very happy to have him here today. Uh, colleagues, you are able to ask questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screens. So I'm just keeping an eye on that and seeing uh, if there are questions that can be asked. Uh, in the meantime, Madhu, just a question from my side. So a lot of the confusion, I think, from the public arose from uh, mixed messages sent by more authoritarian or, or, or more entities more in authority, like the WHO. So people get confused between should they wear masks, shouldn't they wear masks. In, in the beginning was don't wear masks do wear masks, then it was don't uh, jog with a mask, but you must jog with a mask. Uh, it's not a problem to jog with a mask, you know. Um, so I, I'm wondering, apart from obvious, the obvious political, um, um, you know, uh, interventions and uh, uh, mixture, uh, epistem epistem epistemic, um, uh, you know, trespassing from different research fields, but also uh, you know, the type of messages that came from, from the authorities, uh, whether that you think that has played a big role in, in um, you know, actually decreasing this, the, the trust in, in science. Um, great question. And I have been asked that question many times. And yes, um, having participated in multiple WHO um, guideline committees, um, WHO um, is a cautious agency. Uh, unless, unless there is sufficient evidence, um, since they use the great guideline development approach, they're not able to make definitive statements. And, and in a crisis like this, where people are expecting immediate answers, um, the WHO processes are probably too slow. And WHO in turn relies on research done by others to synthesize them and make them into guidelines. So this is definitely a, a, an area of crisis. And I think they're trying to do be more uh, nimble about rapid, um, rapid advice kind of situations. But but I think the, the what this pandemic is showing us is that the public has outlandish expectations of the scientific community. They want a cure tomorrow. They want to know whether masks work today, right now. And sometimes when we just don't have the science ready, nobody's ever done that kind of research on masks and COVID nineteen. How do you come up with a definitive statement? To me, as I saw someone mention, you, we should be more worried about people who are cocksure about what they're saying in this crisis because in all likelihood they're wrong, right? So although it's easy to be confident and say, this should be done and this absolutely works and, and public laps it up, policymakers love it, media loves it because everybody wants certainty. The reality is even the most thoughtful researchers are saying, we don't know 55 things right now, right? So there is a disconnect between the humility that real deep scientists are having about how much they don't know about COVID and these random people who are cocksure about what they're saying and running ahead with it and, and promoting their ideas as if they found an answer to it, right? Mm -hmm. I've had uh, artificial intelligence scientists write to me saying, Work with us in 48 hour hackathon, we will figure out whether BCG protects against COVID or not. I said, get out of my face. I don't have time for this. <laughs> right? I've spent a decade working on this and I don't know what the hell is going on and you wanna hack that for me in 24 hours, right? That's the kind of rubbish cocksureness that, the, that some of the big data AI scientists, they think that they can just solve it in, in 24 hours. Right? Management people think that they have the answer, right? I mean, we got to be more humble. And I, and I would also end by saying that media I've discovered by running two courses for them are terrible at communicating uncertainty. So, so in other words, if, if WHO does change its advice, would that be not be normal science, right? As the evidence accumulates, you iterate your priors and you come up with better, or you go against something and you say, this doesn't work. Right? So we may have started off saying hydroxychloroquine may be promising. Half a dozen randomized trials later, we should now be able to say, drop hydroxychloroquine, save your money, save your patients, go do something else. Right? That is normal science. But by not communicating that that's how normal science works, 
we set up this crazy expectations that we are not able to meet. And people think that changing our minds as scientists is a bad thing. How is it a bad thing? Science works by iterating what we know. Some of the biggest advances in science have come out of failing, changing our mind, and then correcting or doing course correction. That is normal science. So I think we all need to lower people's crazy expectations that we will find solutions overnight and we will not change our mind. Of course, we'll change our mind. That is our job as scientists. So we need to be more humble, I think. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think uh, very important to, to, for us as scientists to really make sure that people understand the scientific process and the process of you know, trial and, and error and, uh, and changing your mind if, if the evidence points in a different direction. So one of the questions here, thank you for such a robust review of the current trend in COVID-19 research. Whose responsibility is it supposed to be safeguarding research information that is given to the naive public? I can think of the recovery trial outcomes that came through the media before peer review. Is it the journalists or a certain body in government? What do you think, uh, Madhu? Great question. And, and one of the uh, most bizarre thing in this crisis is how agencies that we would think are like the guardians of evidence-based thinking have been actively destroyed and sidelined, right? Take uh, the attacks on WHO, for example, relentless attacks right from the president of the United States, and the US is the biggest uh, funder of WHO, to um, all sorts of uh, people in the media, to all sorts of uh, people uh, accusing uh, WHO for being a, a, a Chinese uh, a agency. I mean, it's just absolute bonkers. Now take within countries, the fact that the United States has absolutely sidelined centers for disease control. I mean, CDC wrote the textbook on what to do without BRICS. They came up with the Epidemic Intelligence Service more than 50 years ago, and they are marginalized and completely shipped out of the decision-making authority. In countries like India, the most leading scientists have been muzzled, right? So when you actively disempower your own public health bodies that you had put together and funded them for years, and you allow politicians who don't know shit about what they're doing to make decisions, we end up with this absolute bonker scenario, which is completely unacceptable. To me, politicians, are not there to make scientific decisions. When they get into science, they are also trespassing beyond their borders and it can be terrible and disastrous and we've learned that lesson. So to me, we need to bring back public health agencies and just let them do their jobs. That is what I would, I would ask for. Okay, thank you. Um... Another question for Madhu. Um, thank you for a great and emotive presentation. To what extent would you say the pivoting is in part a reflection of the publish or perish culture? Oh, yes. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I we have to be honest. I mean, academics are academics and, and I'm not justifying, I'm not saying we can't be better people, right? But we, we run wherever there's money and we run wherever there's a chance of publishing and wherever there's a chance of getting our names out. And, and we have to acknowledge that that's how our normal, that's how we've been incentivized, let's put it that way, right? Unless in, incentives change in how we run academia, we, we cannot expect academics to behave differently. So for example, let's say I want to contribute to a bigger trial but I will not be the lead author or the first author on that trial. Would my university value that work as much if I were the first author on this new trial on COVID-19, right? So I would argue that universities and funding bodies have to change how they reward science, right? For too long, we've rewarded these lone wolves in science, right? One person gets all the grants, there's a star researcher, that person gets showcased everywhere and nobody else gets anything to a more distributed way of doing things where we do value collaborative research. To me, we are learning just as COVID-19 has exposed all the weaknesses in society, 
it is also showing some of the biggest weaknesses in how science is normally done. That science is the selfish pursuit of individual glory and not designed by itself to be collaborative, collegial, and collective, right? We compete, we're used to competing, and we like to compete, but what if we flipped the switch and, and rewarded collaboration in science? Would we have done better with this pandemic is a question worth asking. Hmm. Okay, yes. Um, uh, a question from Andrew Whitelaw. Uh, surely a large driver of the problem is the funding, as you pointed out. How do we ensure that funding agencies have a proportional response so that they divert some funding to addressing the crisis without losing the funding for non-crisis related activities? And I would like to add to that, uh, do you think we're going to soon see a shift back? Um, and, and what do you think that time period would be? <laughs> Again, uh, in an ideal world, we would have brand new funding for COVID and we absolutely mm. should be investing in it. And even if we do withdraw funding from other areas, we should do it in a manner that doesn't force all academics to think that if they didn't write a grant on COVID, their research lab is finished. We cannot leave researchers hanging dry. Let's imagine a research lab that has been very successfully working for many years and producing top class research in, in childhood pneumonia. Do we shut that down just because there is, they, they're not working on COVID? That would be tragic in my opinion. So funders have to be super careful about this, right? They, ask, they send the wrong message, they create a stampede in the, in the research environment. And some funders have spectacularly failed in this area. Um, uh, I kid you not, I was so thrilled to see this. After reading one of my early blogs on COVIDization, um, Matthias Egger, who is the president of the Swiss National Science Foundation, not just tweeted about it, but he wrote a whole piece saying, we, that is the Swiss National Science Foundation will not be COVIDized, right? We continue to believe that academics doing meaningful work in all areas are equally worthy of support. We will not get COVIDized. And he's explicitly written and published that, right? To me, that is a very thoughtful scientific funding agency. They are sitting, they're thinking, they're debating, because what if the next year's crisis is something else? Are they now going to completely divert to this area? And if we keep diverting like this, what is the funding for long-term sustained work in any area of, of research, right? So I would love, I don't know what the South African MRC has done, but I would love for them to at least acknowledge the risks of COVIDization but at a minimum. That is what I would want to see from my, my uh, research funding agency leadership. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, obviously, this has an impact on emerging researchers and, and, the, and the junior researchers that are coming through the ranks. Uh, Professor Sidat says uh, she's concerned about the impact that, has, that it has on the emerging researchers. Do you have any? Thoughts on, on how oh, to I, I'm that. so I'm so worried about uh, emerging researchers, I'm, and I'm particularly worried about students. I've had so many PhD students uh, contact me and says, "Professor Pai, I don't work on infectious diseases at all. What should I do? Should I change my thesis topic?" I said, "Oh my God, what a horrible thing for a young person to think about, right? If somebody is passionately working on schizophrenia or you know something else." why on earth would they feel like they have to divert to working on COVID-19? This is bonkers. And it absolutely should not be allowed that, that that kind of pressure put on a young person. Because obviously they're thinking, if they're not, if they're working on schizophrenia and it's not gonna get funded, or if it's not gonna be a research priority for the near future, am I wasting my, my, my life doing a postdoc or whatever, or being a junior faculty working in that area? We need to reassure young people and tell them, that whatever you're working on, so long as you're passionate about it and you care about it and you really do a good job, that will be valuable for the society, right? That, that, that we need to find a way to reassure young people and not divert. So, so that's another reason why we cannot afford to only fund COVID or only promote COVID research. We must find a way, but it seems so difficult in this current climate, right? Every other journal is only dealing with deluge of COVID papers, they're not even able to peer review a great study on some other topic and no media is picking up 
any research other than COVID. So it's almost like those not working in COVID are, are shouting into some kind of a, the wind and hoping to be heard and they're not being heard. We got to change this. We cannot, I can't see this, how sustainable this can be. And it's disastrous for younger researchers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so our time is running out. Uh, there, uh, there are many questions and uh, it's a bit we I can answer them. I can try and answer them online. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put my responses in the Q&A box. That's, today. that's wonderful. Thank you, Madhu. And, and thank you once again for, for your time and for being here today. We sincerely appreciate it. It's still early morning there on your side, as far as I know. Uh, so I hope you didn't have to wake up too early. Uh, it's a pleasure really and an honor. And I wish you the very best in the rest of the uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, um, so we've come to the end of our first session of the annual academic day. We now are going to go into a, over to a tea break and post the session. But before we do, I'd like to just uh, announce the winners for the, uh, for the undergraduate research poster prizes. So we have uh, three prizes, vouchers to the value of 2,500, 1,500 and 1,000 rand for the um, undergraduate researchers with the best posters. And uh, we're very excited to announce the names of these prize winners. So the first prize for 2,500 Rand is uh, Fra Frandine Latigan, BSc Physio and her group members in the Division of Physiotherapy, Misha Erasmus, Marnes van die Kerk, Giandre Olefier, Chris Marie Lombard and Nina McCarthy with the supervisors Martin Heine and Susan Hanekom. The title of that post is Effectiveness of Health Literacy Interventions Compared to Standard Care in Adults with Cardiovascular Disease Living in Low to Middle Income Countries, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. The second prize is a value of a 1,500 voucher, Joanna Extian, MBCHB, undergraduate student with supervisors and co-authors in the divisions of Dermatology and Epidemiology and Biostats. Uh, it's Johan de Wett, uh, Willi Fischer, Carl Lombard and Bianca Todd. And the title is Ache of Acral Melanoma, Prospective Doctor's Lack of Awareness. And the third prize of a thousand rand uh, voucher, Emma McChrystal, BC Dietetics, on behalf of the Retail Research Group in the Division of Human Nutrition. And the title, Snack Foods Displayed at Retail Checkout Counters in Cape Town, South Africa. So congratulations to our undergraduate researchers. We're very excited always to see the undergraduate research also uh, being part of annual academic day and, and to strengthen and grow that um, in this faculty. So we're going to go over to the uh, tea break now. Uh, please join us later for the next session. Uh, please also uh, go and look at the posters and uh, leave your comments for, for the authors of the posters. People have worked hard to prepare these posters and we value your, um, your contributions to the, to the annual academic day also. Thank you very much. Uh, see you a bit later. Thank you.